here we are, week three of our summer series. I know that you guys have been totally blessed so far. You guys have had two talks already in this series. I know that you've had the lovely Claire, who was just here a second ago, and you've had Fred Badu, who is our Hemel, uh, sorry, Luton site pastor. I've got a Hemel with Luton. Luton site pastor. He was speaking to you um, last week. And so if you've missed any of those, by the way, if you've been on holiday and you want to catch up, you can do so on our Verso YouTube channel. Um, and so I'm really excited. Oh, sorry, you you guys are going out, forgot to dismiss you. I mean, you can stay if you want. We'd love to have you. Bless you guys. Have a great time. The youth have just got back, actually, I think, a little while ago from DTI, and we're going to be hearing more about what's, go- what's been going on for them next week, so don't miss that. Um, but yeah, here we are, here I am in our week three of our summer series, and I'm really excited that I get to share with you something that I believe God has been talking to me about recently. He's really laid it on my heart and been revealing, um, again, this topic to me over the last couple of months. You know, this season for me is pretty full on, not talking about just the summer holidays, although they can be full on in itself with little kids, Um, but just this season in general. You know, life is pretty crazy, juggling work and family and church and finances and health and everything in between. You know, it's a lot, isn't it, sometimes? It's a lot. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but it can feel like you're going through the motions of life from one thing to the next, and you can be surrounded by lots of people at times, and yet still feel totally unseen. Like no one really gets it. No one sees you or how you're feeling. And, you know, no one notices because everyone's got their own stuff going on. But I want to say this morning, I want to remind us, remind you that there is somebody who sees it all. Most importantly, he sees you. And that is our God, the creator of heaven and earth the almighty and powerful God of the universe. He sees me and he sees you and he gets it. And so the title of this talk is simply The God Who Sees. The God Who Sees. You know, as a mum of four young kids, as much as I try to see them individually and I try to notice them when they need me to notice them and try and listen intently and see them when I need to throughout the day, you know, there's times when I don't because... I get distracted, or I get busy, or I just want five minutes to scroll, or five minutes just to be in my own thoughts. And sometimes we can pretend, can't we? Maybe that's just me. (laughs) Maybe that's just me. But I'll say, wow, that's amazing. That's like my go-to line. And then I have a four-year-old who's like, no, mum, that's not amazing. I'm like, oh, okay, it's not. Sorry, I lost, you know, lost, not interest. I just lost what you were saying. (laughs) And I get busted. We all have this innate need, don't we, to be seen and to be known. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's the way we're designed to be. God created us that way. It's easy to look sometimes to other things to fill that need, our friends, our family, social media. We scream out, do you see me? Hi, do you see me? Do you like me? We scream it out, don't we, all the time. But the truth is, people aren't able to see us in the way that we hope they will all the time or need them to. I know I can't, as I just shared. And I think because I'm aware of my own limitations as a mum, I think sometimes it's easy for me to project those limitations onto God and say, well, I'm a, God, I'm a, I'm a mum of four children and I struggle to see them all individually. So how could God, who's the father of loads of children, see everyone individually and give them all the time and the, and the attention that people need. He's got way more important things to do, surely, way more prayers to answer. And I think that's where the lie of the enemy creeps in, isn't it? When he whispers and he says, God doesn't see you. Are you serious? You think he's bothered about you and what's going on in your life? Are you seriously going to make this about you when there's so many more problems in the world and things that people are facing that are bigger than what you're facing. But that's not the truth of who God is. And it's not the truth of what we read about in the Bible. Okay. 
You know, God has a number of different names that he is revealed, uh, reveals in the Bible. Each one tells us something significant and important about his character. I think there's between 20 and 24 different names that God has. Jehovah Jireh, the God will provide. Jehovah Rapha, the God who will heal. And one of those names that he has is El Roy. El Roy, literally translated from the Hebrew as the God who sees me. The God who sees me. And this name is actually used only once in the Bible. Did you know that? Only once in the Bible. And it's given to God by a young slave girl called Hagar. And we read about this. We read about what happened to get to, for Hagar to get to the point where she gives God this name in Genesis 16. And so we're going to unpack that together this morning. But before we do, before we dive into that scripture, I want to give you a bit of a background, a bit of a lowdown on what's happened so far before we get to this point. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. It's an incredible story. God has promised Abraham, his name hasn't changed yet to Abraham, so it's Abraham, that he was going to be the father of many. God said that I'm going to give you a son And from him, there's going to be a mighty nation. Through you and your wife, even though Sarai, again, her name hadn't changed yet to Sarah, despite her old age, she was past childbearing age. Despite that, God promised them that he was going to give them a son. And so these guys have been waiting for quite a long time. I think it's about 15 years altogether. I mean, that's a long time. They've been waiting for this promise to come to pass. So they thought clearly like none of us ever do, that they better help God out. They better help God out with his promise. He needs a bit of a helping hand. He's got too many other promises he has to fulfill before he gets to their one. Or maybe he's just forgotten what he said he was going to do. So these guys agreed that Abraham should take their Egyptian slave girl as a second wife. She would have been about 18 years of age. And then perhaps she will give him a son. And so this Egyptian slave girl, she does in fact fall pregnant with Abraham's first child. And so here we have Hagar, who is carrying Abraham's first child, and she starts to act a little bit more important than maybe she should have done. And this quite rightly annoys Sarai, and so she complains about her to Abraham. And Abraham is really caring, and he says, do you know what? She's your slave, you do what you want with her. And so she does. Sarai starts to show no care at all towards Hagar. In fact, she actually starts to mistreat her and abuse her to the point where it's so bad that Hagar runs away. She runs away into the desert and that is where we pick up at verse 7. So Genesis 16, verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you'll give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. But she said, I've now seen the one who sees me. That's why the well was called Beer Lehay Roy. It's still there between Kadesh and Bered. And so here we read how Hagar, this 18-year-old pregnant girl, had fled and she'd found herself alone in the desert by this well. She had been used, she had been mistreated by the people that she should have been able to look up, the people who should have looked after her and cared for her. In fact, the only people she knew who knew God had hurt her the most. 
The people who should have been loyal to her, the people who should have been looking out for her, did neither of those things. And in fact, they left her feeling hurt and broken and abandoned. I mean, how bad must it have been for this 18-year-old girl who's just found out she's pregnant to leave the tribe, the safety of that tribe, and run into the desert? Instead of staying and facing the situation, she runs. Maybe you can relate to that. I know I can. I know there have been plenty of times where I feel so overwhelmed by a situation that just seems too much. And instead of wanting to stay and face it head on, I just want to run. I want to turn my back on it. And so here she was, Hagar. She was exhausted. She was hurt. She was probably scared. And it says she was sat down by a spring of water next to a well. And she was figuring out what on earth she's going to do. Where's she going to go next? And verse 7 and verse 8, the angel of the Lord found her and spoke to her. This is the first time in scripture that we read about the angel of the Lord appearing. Up to this point, the angel of the Lord has never appeared. And so who is this angel of the Lord? When we read the rest of the Old Testament, we see that the angel of the Lord appears in numerous different passages. And it's believed that this angel is the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ himself. How beautiful is that? Jesus found her. Jesus came after her when no one else was looking and he found her sitting by a well, thirsty and broken. The first time the angel of the Lord is mentioned and he shows up to a slave girl on the run. And so he finds her and what does he say? He says, Hagar. Hagar. He calls her by her name. Up until this point, she would have just been slave girl. Abraham and Sarai would never have called her by her name. She was just slave girl, the slave girl that they used to get what they wanted. But God shows up and the first thing he does is he affirms her identity and he says, I know you, I know your name, Hagar. And then he asks this question, where have you come from and where are you going? Now, as we know, God knows the answer to this question, doesn't he? God is omniscient, he is all-knowing. So why does he ask her this question? I think it's for two reasons. Number one, he asks her because he wants her to know and to recognise and to understand where it is that she's at. And she answers it quite literally, doesn't she? She says, I'm running away from my mistress. And number two, I think God asks her this question as an invitation, as an opportunity for her to open up to him and to be honest with him and to be real with him. We see it throughout the Bible, don't we? Particularly in the New Testament with Jesus. He asks a lot of questions, but he's really saying, come on, let's talk about it. Let's talk about this. You can be real with me. We don't have to use fancy words. Let's just say it how it is. An opportunity for us to build relationship with him. And I think that question really stuck with me as I was reading it. And I don't think God at this point is asking this question because he's interested in her physical destination. But really, I think he's interested in her spiritually, like what's going on for her spiritually and emotionally. Like, how are you actually doing, Hagar? And so my question to you this morning is, where have you come from and where are you going? I want to encourage you to take some time to be real with God. Say it as it is and tell him how it is you're feeling. And then after Hagar tells the angel of the Lord that she's running away in verse nine, the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. I'm sorry, what? You want me to go back? I've just run away. I don't think that's what Hagar was expecting the angel of the Lord to say, to be quite honest. And I don't think when I was reading it, that's what I was expecting it to say. 
And in fact, I think if I was stood there with Hagar, I definitely wouldn't be giving her that advice. But the angel of the Lord tells her to go back to her situation. Do we have any idea why this is? Verse 10, then the angel said, I will increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to count. He blesses her. Why are you asking me to go back to that situation? Because the Lord says, I have a better plan for you. Even when you don't think that I'm working, I am. Even when you don't think I'm with you, I am. I have good plans for you. I have good purposes for your life, plans to give you hope and a future. Go back and I will pour out my blessing on you. How many times have we expected God to pull us out of a situation, to remove us from a situation? If God sees me, then surely he'd remove me from this situation that's making me feel so uncomfortable and that's so hurtful and that's so unjust. And because he hasn't removed me, surely God doesn't see me. But here we have, a God, here we have God who sees Hagar and he asks her to go back, but with the promise of a blessing to come. The angel of the Lord goes on to prophesy over her child. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you'll give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. God will hear. That's what that means, Ishmael. God will hear. For the Lord has heard. Well, what did the Lord hear? Heard her pleas of help? Heard her on her knees praying out, calling out? Because up until this point, there's no indication in the text that Hagar had prayed there's no indication that she had prayed to God to to help her. For the Lord has heard your misery. The Lord has heard of your misery. God hears your cries of distress. He hears your weeping in the night. He hears your groaning. When you don't even have the words to pray, God hears. He goes on, verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Now, to be honest, this doesn't sound like a great thing, does it? Is that just not just me then, right? If someone prophesied this over my son, I'd be like, what? But when you put it into context... The language at the time, being a wild donkey, do you know what that actually means? It means that he can never be tamed. He can never be enslaved. What he's saying to her is that your descendants, Hagar, are no longer going to be in slavery. They're no longer going to be an enslaved people. They're going to be free. I'm going to set you free, Hagar. I'm going to release you and I'm going to bless you so much that your descendants are going to be a great nation. And then Hagar responds in such a beautiful way. She gives, verse 13, she gives this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. El Roy. The only time in scripture that somebody gives God a name and he accepts it. The other times he reveals his name. The only time he's given a name. You know, her situation hadn't changed, had it? Like she was going to go back to the same people who were mistreating her, who didn't care for her. Nothing had changed there. As far as we know, it was going to be the same abuse and the same mistreatment. Her pain didn't just disappear in an instant. On the outside, it didn't look like anything had changed, but it had For her, in that moment, everything changed. Things were never going to be the same again because she had now seen the one who sees her. She knew that God saw her. He sees her. And because of that, she was able to go back to where God was asking her to go back to. In the middle of the pain, in the middle of the desert, she chose to praise God. She praised him by giving him a new name, a new name which 
recognize him for who he is and his character. Sometimes I think it's easy for us to want God to remove us from the situation that we're in, but instead he chooses to reveal to us something of who he is, something more of his character. He knows what it is we need and he sees you. You know, I love the fact that God sees us first. He saw Hagar first, didn't he? She wasn't looking for him. She wasn't praying to him. And yet God showed up. He found her. He heard her cries of distress and her pain. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've never seen him or you've been never even looking for him before. You're totally not really even interested and you don't really know why you're here. You're just here because you've been invited by a friend and you don't want to be rude. But can I say to you this morning that it's, there's no accident that you're here. God has been pursuing you for your whole life. He loves you. He knows you by name. He sees you. And he's saying to you this morning, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Or maybe you're here and you know Jesus and you believe that he loves you, but recently you've been doubting, actually, does he see you at all? In fact, it feels like sometimes God is walking straight past you. You know, like when you think you catch someone's eye and you, you see them waving and you wave and then they come over and they actually walk straight past you and they're waving at someone behind you and you're like, that was a bit awkward. That happens all the time to me. Sometimes it can feel like that. It can feel like you've seen God. Oh yeah, great, he's seen me. And actually it feels like he's walking straight past you. It feels like he's showing up to everyone else around you except you. But he's saying, I am the God who sees you. I see you. I see your frustration. I see your pain. I see what it is that you're going through. You know, maybe you are a stay-at-home mum and you feel absolutely overwhelmed and exhausted and you're constantly feeling like you can't give any more and yet somehow it doesn't feel like enough. It feels like you're failing as a mum, as a wife, as a friend, as a Christian even. And God says this morning, I see you. I see you. Or maybe you're someone who is working really hard at work so diligently because you are desperate for that affirmation or for your boss to notice you or for your colleagues to notice you. And in fact, it feels like no one even knows you're there. And God says, I know and I see you. Maybe you're laying awake at night and you're unable to sleep because you're in turmoil. You've got so much going on in your head. You're worrying about money. You're worrying about how you're going to pay the next bill. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage and you feel desperate for God to come and restore what it was that you once had. And you feel like giving up. You feel hopeless. And God says, I see you. Maybe you're battling health issues you're longing for a healing of some kind and yet you keep praying but nothing seems to be happening. Maybe you are um, at a crossroads in your life and you're wondering which direction to go in. Should you say yes to this opportunity? Should you say no? And you're crying out and it feels like God is just silent. He's ignoring you. Maybe you're here at church and you come week after week. You serve, you smile, you say hi, you try your best but actually really, you think, nobody sees me. Nobody would even notice if I was here one week and not the next. And God says this morning, he sees you. He sees you. I am the one who will show up in the desert when you least expect it. When you feel alone and abandoned, I'm right there with you. I know you're hurting and I know you're in pain but I've heard your distress and I'm here to tell you that I am with you. I also want you to know that this isn't it. You can face this situation because of who I am, because I am with you. I am El Roy. I am for you and not against you. Isaiah 43 
says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be burned. El Roy, I am with, I see you, I am with you. And you know, the original translation in Hebrew for El Roy is shepherd. He watches over us. He leads us. He guides us. He protects us. Jesus, as well, in the New Testament, he describes himself as the good shepherd, doesn't he? We see that throughout the whole gospel of Jesus' life and interactions, the way he sees the individual, the ways he locks eyes with the one, and he sees them for who they are. And he asks that same question, where have you come from and where are you going? You know, the blind man who was begging and Jesus and his disciples are walking past. No one sees him, but Jesus does. He sees him and he heals him. The lady who touched Jesus' cloak when he was on his way to go and heal Jairus' daughter, a crowd of people around him. No one else sees this lady. In fact, she would have been ostracized from society. She was bleeding. She had done for 12 years, and yet Jesus sees her. And what does he do? He calls her, he affirms her identity and calls her daughter. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who no one liked, who climbed the tree, and yet Jesus sees him, calls him by name, and invites himself to hang out at his house. The centurion, the lepers, the prostitutes, the demon-possessed, Jesus sees them all. He doesn't look past anyone, and you're included in that. He doesn't look past you. And so one more thing as we finish this, this morning. One more thing that I found really interested, interesting in this text in Genesis 16 is that when the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar, she's on her way to Shur, which is in Egypt. So this is where she's heading, probably because she thinks, if only I can get there, if only I can get to Egypt, then I'll be okay. But God asks her to go back because it's there that she'll be blessed, not there. So what he's really saying to Hagar is, not only do I see you, but I see a way. Not only do I see you and what you're going through, but I see a way. I see a way that's different to you. But are you going to trust me? Do we trust in God, in what he can see? Or are we going to rely on what it is that we can see? Sometimes I think we can be so focused on running from the situation that we're in because we think, if only I can get there, then I'll be okay. If only the kids were a little bit older and more independent, then I'll be okay. If only I got that promotion at work, then I'd be okay. If only I had that healing, then I'd be okay. If only I had a wife or a husband that appreciated me, then I'd be okay. Sometimes... We need to stop running. We need to stay where it is that God has put us. For some of us, we need to go back to where he's asking us to so that we can experience the blessing that he has for us in that place. He's saying this morning, I know it's hard, sweetheart, son. I get it. I see you. I see it all. And if you can only stick it out, there is so much blessing that I have for you in that place. Shall we do this together? Do you trust me? Do you want to take my hand? Because I am with you. I'm always with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you trust in the way that I see for you and for your life? Or are you going to trust only in what you can see? I got this, says the Lord. I've got you. I see you. I am Elroy. Would you guys stand?